I think that uh, it's a surprise that Court is speaking today because of the uh, Native America, this week in Native America. So we, we all have a treat tonight. All right, and we are live. Hello, everybody. We are live, and we got everybody here. So over in this corner, we got the Grovers. Over in that corner, we got Casey. And don't forget about Heather. Mm -hmm. But we got uh, Kimberly Medicine Horde, uh, Karen Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like we got Richard Silversmith. Woo -hoo. Hi, Richard. Carlin's Hi, here. how you doing? Jeanette. Hello, everyone, and hello, Facebook world. This is in Good Medicine Way, where and the first few people I mentioned are part of the major team. It's such a great time to be here with you guys on this Monday night. It's kind of windy here in Peru. And if you don't know, I'm actually from this little town of New Mexico. Peru, New Mexico. And so I would be stepping out to normal. I was planning to step out, but with the wind and with the <clears throat> with the unaccountable weather, weather, I didn't want to have the mic be all fuzzy and going in and out. So with that, um gonna be doing the four direction prayers, but so let's all come together, relax. And breathe. Like I said, I'm here on the great Navajo Nation of my people, the Dene people, or Navajo people, in the four corner region of New Mexico, uh, Texas, Colorado, and Utah, parts of Utah. So, it was great being here and also understanding, but and knowing that we were removed from this land, but we were able to be one of, uh, to be come back to my own hometown. And, and also coming to live here on the actual land of my people. So, great spirit of light, come to me out of the east with the power of the risen sun. Let there be light in my words. Let there be light in my path as, that I walk. Let me remember always that you gave the gift of a new day and never let me burden with sorrow by not starting over again. Great spirit of creation, send me warm and soothing winds from the south. Comfort me and Caress me when I try, tired and cold. Unfold me like the gentle breeze that unfolds the leaves on the trees. As you give all your earth, the earth your warmth and moving wind. Give to me what I may grow close to you and and warmth, warmth the great light, great spirit. <clears throat> I face the west. The direction of sundown, let me remember every day that the moment will come when my sun will go down. Never let me forget that I must fade into you. Give me a beautiful color. Give me a great sky for setting so that when it is my time to meet you, I come with glory. Great spirit of love. <clears throat> Give me this, guys. Come to me with the power of the north. Make me courageous. When the winds fall upon me, give me strength and endurance for everything that is harsh, anything that hurts, anything that makes me squint. Let me move through life ready to take what comes from the north. Man did not create the web of life. He is but a strand in it. Whenever man does to the web, he does to himself. Like, 
Just thank you for allowing us to become into your lives today. Allow that winds of moments embrace you. And if you are standing on solid ground or anywhere, just remember the the sun is from Father Sky. We have blue skies from Father. We have a ground to stand on our two feet on the Mother Earth. We have, or if you are an elder, you have six because you have you have the chair to sit on. So we use our strength of our feet and the chairs of the legs to help us posture up, sit up straight with the Lord, so that we can bring the love from all directions, including ourselves and bring it from creator and, and learn how to strengthen that love from here on out and everywhere. Amen. Amen. We're going to switch things around a little bit and uh, bring Cortland Hopkins up, our correspondent from the Lakota Nation and good brother of the Lord. Uh, this is the This Week in Native America section. Take it away, Cortland. Oh, Mataku Yippee. I was uh, glad to see you all, and I'm uh, glad to be here uh, just to comment and give uh, well, just some context to the history that we've all lived. Um, I, I appreciate this um, this chance just to speak a little bit about um, you know, what happened this week in you know in history uh but first before that yeah uh yeah friends uh with uh with casey with preston with heather you know um been you know preached here before if uh none of you if some of you have not seen me and i'm on ute land um right now here in durango colorado in the the animus valley i wish i knew the the ute name for that but th those are the people that that's the land that i'm on so um, yeah, very glad to be here to give you a brief segment. I was reflecting a little bit today on um, this is uh, this week is the anniversary of the Fort Laramie Treaty, uh, the Fort Laramie Treaty in 1868. There are actually several Fort Laramie treaties. Um, the first one was the, actually the one in 1851, which um, uh, obviously broke down, and the second one, the Fort Laramie, the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, is the one that is legally still in force. And um, it's notable for a lot of reasons. For um, one of the reasons this is that this was actually one of the last treaties that the federal government made with Indian peoples. Um, part of the reason for that is, is because uh, the, the Indians actually won. <laughs> in, the Indians actually won the, uh, the war in 1868, um, Red Clouds War. And, um, it's, uh, and as a result, the government uh, changed its entire policy. So that's why um, you know the uh, the people on you know in um, uh, uh, in Hawaii don't have any relationship official relationship with the federal government, and neither do any of the tribes in Alaska have any treaty obligations or or, or um, connections with the federal government. They have to do it a very different way. So that's significant in its own right, right there. But I wanted to talk very briefly just on why I why I think that's important. You know. Um, I was actually able to go to um, Fort Laramie this last summer. I was on uh, doing a scouting trip uh, for uh, some uh, native university business of whom I work with. And I decided we left very late in the day, <laughs> but I still decided, you know, we should just drive to Fort Laramie. You know, it's only like about 30 minutes off the trail. Uh, let's go there and go see what it's all about. And when we were there, it was, it was interesting because like all, all the, um, all the images you usually see of the fort have walls and, you know, right there, but all those walls are gone. And now all that's left are the Calvary Post buildings that were there. And while I was there, um, and there's a few ruins of some of the older buildings, it used to be a much larger installation. Now, when the treaty happened, there was a very, a lot of um, commissioners that had come there, but since so many tribal people came, they actually did not have the, uh, the signing of the treaty at the fort. They actually had it at a creek a couple miles away, which is on private property now. Um, and so as a result, the, the the land there is still the connection point. But I was thinking a little bit, I was thinking, why is it important? Why is it important for me to come to this place? Why do I feel this sort of connection? What's the spiritual ramifications of it? And while we were there, I realized I was thinking of something that we've been taught that 
I've heard a lot from a lot of Native folks is that when we move forward, we have to look backward. We have to kind of see where we've come. We have to see the connection. We have to feel things tangibly. Not everything, that's probably one of the great downfalls of the Western world is that nothing is tangible. There's that lack of connection. And the real physical connection to land is something that is very beautiful. That's very gorgeous. And a lot of the controversies that come later have to be recognized there. So often a lot of Lakota people, whenever there are official meetings, they'll have the park service, will let the uh, tribes have meetings, have gatherings at the site of the fort. And I thought, and I thought, what a Lakota thing to do. Because part of it is that this is a starting point. When I was thinking about this, there, there, there are a lot of stories come together at Fort Laramie. Um, you know, a, a few miles away, there's the great ruts that the wagons made, you know, that they cut into the stone just because there was so much traffic cutting through and the ruts are six feet high, you know, and you just think about how many people are moving, how many people are there. And I was thinking of this notion is that if we ever want to actually have beginnings, if we want to do what creator sets free, you know, is telling conquers the people, what he's telling him is like, you know, you must be born from above. It only makes sense that you would go maybe where there was error, maybe where there was disconnection, maybe where there where the story really started. And I think that Fort Laramie is the place and where the treaty was separates the old past, you know, everything that happened before and what it is now. Like everything that's happened now happened there. So in some way, in some connection. And while I was, oh wait, I just realized I was gonna share a screen picture of what it looked like don't worry this won't become a like a very long slideshow but this is the like looking um this is looking south so they have like um it has it's like a football track all the way around there um the buildings are uh, very well preserved there's the monument to the right hand side that uh the historical monument that says what the what the fort is what it's about that might have been what was originally there before and then then this is the view looking north and i, I just love it's a very beautiful place it's a very beautiful place. It's a very beautiful place in summertime. And we were there by ourselves. Um, the, you know, they, they just, um, there was no one actually on site. It was just me and me and Rashawn. And while we were there, we saw eagles flying in the trees in the background. And I kind of thought about this and I thought, you know, you know, I feel like, you know, what, what's, what's happening is like, it, it, it will push through, you know, kind of like what the prayer we were talking about this morning, you know, pushes through. And I just got the, the very strange feeling there while I was like, it's going to be all right, you know, like things are going to work out you know very different than you know, kind of the uh, attitudes that i grew up with but as i think about it and as we reflect on it it's like this is where you know this is where today kind of began but it's also where yesterday comes in contact with today and also where the future is as well so um yep so i, I would if you if you're ever in the area i would encourage you to you know to, to, to drop by to take a look at it you know i think that there's something very special about that and for me it was coming in contact with my own past my own relations right there and realize this is where it really happened. This is where it happened. And, you know, and this is where things are going to happen. And I already have plans and thoughts about ways to do that immediately. So I want to thank you again for allowing me to have the moment and talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Cortland. All right. Got a couple songs. Again, I hate to duck out, but I have a, a previous thing. So, uh, God you know, bless you all. Creator Station, uh, face on you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us briefly. <laughs> Thank you, Corlin.
things here real quick.
All right, and now for the creation insights <clears throat> time. I was walking this week, and there was this really big gray cloud. A storm front was coming in, and I thought, <clears throat> you know, that cloud, I believe uh, some natives believe that that's like a, an entity, a, a being, and I thought, well, man, it, it just seems like it's it wasn't there. It's here for a while, and then it'll dissipate. And, you know, how can that be a, a being or an entity? And then I... Then the thought occurred to me, well, I used to fit inside of a period at the end of a sentence and I doubled and doubled and got to this size and one day I'll be in the ground and I'll dissipate and I'll be nothing again. And and uh, then I just thought, huh, that's, pr that's a pretty interesting thought. And uh, and for the time that that cloud was, was in the sky, it was definitely doing its cloud thing in full force. And... Uh, that's what we are to do as well. And who could say whose life is more more substantial? All right, and now, unless there were comments, and people can comment or put something in the chat about that if they want. And I can put turn it over to Casey for his announcements and humor. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not my humor. Yes, uh, announcement. Today, I uh, worked the last couple couple days, and over the weekend, uh, we were donated lots of items for a yard sale to raise money to do some beautification around the church where we're going to be meeting. And the reason we're doing the beautification is because the church was so badly taken care of, and it's no fault of the the congregation, they're all over 70 years old, and uh, so it's hard for them to do that. So uh, so with the help of Leah and a couple other people, my wife and my son and a couple daughters, was able to raise $661 to, to do some work. So, But I tell you, that's a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work to do a, a yard sale like that. Um, Anyone else got an announcement that they want to share? Anything? I, I think the biggest announcement yeah. is Karen. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all. And my announcement is next month, I'm, for those of you that have tuned in to watch me teach a series during the Black History Month. I'm going to be teaching another workshop next month. And what I will be teaching about this go around is the Black Panthers. So I will be teaching a five weekend series. We're meeting every Saturday. Whether you want to be in person or online, yes, I will be teaching about the Black Panthers. And so I'll have more information about that coming soon. So if you're able to attend, please do so. I promise you will learn some information about the Black Panthers that you did not know. I'd like to know when they met Forrest Gump. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. I think Heather had something. Yeah, I do. I'm just going to announce the Women's Circle on Wednesday nights at 7. And we're still doing the Thomas King's The Inconvenient Indian. Um, it's a bit of a heavy book, but it's got a lot of good information. Um, we're learning a lot more about the First Nation people, and I'm learning a lot more about their history. And so it's been really rewarding and uh intelligent and life-giving so just wanted to put that in there for the women's group i have one announcement so i'm uh, with the salvation army but i was transferred this week so we're on the move we're moving at the end of june to regina saskatchewan and so we will be taking over uh, ministries there in the shelters and overseeing the shelters in regina and public relations, and so some of our government relations and things like that. So um, we're on the move. 
Go hang out with Jigabee Quay. All right. Bye. Good people up there. Yeah. Can't wait till we can all get together and see each other again. Uh, any other quick announcements? I got uh, one special announcement. Nobody does. In a couple of weeks here, Laura is going to be, boy, Laura is going to be finishing up law school and graduating with honors and with special awards. And I can say that and toot her horn for her. She's sitting right here with me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're out here in our backyard enjoying enjoying our patio that we made here over all last year's COVID lockdown. But um, yeah, thought it'd be uh, fun for me to share with you a, a couple of things that I, I did this weekend. Uh, I was asked to be a guest speaker at the University Heights United Methodist Church, the church where we are partnering with and sharing facility. And like I said, they're an older congregation. There was, uh, there was six people, and that was including us, in the live portion of it. And there was about eight or nine that were on uh, a Zoom program. So it was kind of neat, kind of weird to, to do it in front of a, a video screen and, and preach like I usually do from a, uh, you know, this time from, not from the pulpit, but from the floor and with the screen, and it went, it went pretty well. Uh, I introduced ourselves of who we are as Good Medicine Way and how our relations going to be with them. And I was uh, not really heady or anything, but just really sharing with them uh, how really needed here in Albuquerque to have a native. There are a couple, but we could use many more here natives in this city. Uh, during that time, I, I did uh, take a time to share that I'm not such a serious guy all the time. And uh, to share with you uh, the top 10 things natives should say to white folks. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so most of the congregation went there, except for one person, uh, a teacher's assistant who was visiting in the congregation there. Um, all the rest were, were white folks. And there were two, we found out later, there were two Navajo ladies uh, that were there. And got to, got to realize that because uh, Laura introduced herself with her clans and her family in, lang in their language. And they were so excited that they contacted the chat line and talked to questions. But I want to share these with you. And I, I always have to give congregations a lot of times permission to laugh. Because uh, a lot of times, uh, if you're in a Methodist service, and I know many other services are very, very stoic and you know, hard to get you even to raise your hands or even to clap in the service. But, I asked them, they knew it's okay to laugh. So these are the top 10 things that natives should say to white folks. Uh, and you have to think of it as native people have had these questions said to them in another way. First one here is, uh, so how much white are you? And I wanna see you guys all laugh. So. <clears throat> Number two. I'm part white myself, you know. Number three, it's all of my people's ways in the Boy Scouts. Number four, my great great grandmother was a full blood, a full blood white American princess. Number five, uh, you don't look white. Number six, I'm not racist. My best friend is white. Number seven. Do you still live in a covered wagon? Number eight. What's the meaning behind the square dance? Can you imagine natives being asked. Number nine. 
touch your facial hair. Number 10. And, you know, we get this when we go to powwows and that here. We get this one here. It says, hey, can I take your picture? Uh, the last one here, and I kind of threw this in. This is my number 11. But uh, it came from Richard. Richard said this one time. He, he was asked the question, uh, do you people still eat buffalo? And Richard's answer was, yes, but just the wings. All right, that's our little comedy hour there. And we'll turn it back over to the Hi there, Jim. <laughs> All right. That was pretty funny. I like that. What's the meaning behind the square dance? I, I think that, that was my <laughs> favorite. <laughs> All right, now we got Heather with uh, Reading of Creator's Word. Today we are in Matthew 9, and I'm reading from 1 to 17. Um, and here it goes. Who can forgive broken ways? So Creator sets free, Jesus, and his close followers climbed back into the canoe and crossed over to the other side of the lake and went to the village where he was staying. Some people there came carrying a crippled man lying on a sleeping mat and brought him to creator sets free jesus when he saw their faith in him he said to the crippled man be brave my son you are released from your broken ways when they heard this some of the scroll keepers began to grumble among themselves this man is speaking against the great spirit and his ways in his spirit creator sets free jesus knew what they were thinking why are your hearts so full of dark thoughts, he said to them. Is it easier to tell a crippled man, get up and walk, or to say to him, you are released from your broken ways? The crowd grew quiet as all eyes turned to creator sets free Jesus, waiting to see what he would do. This is how you will know that the true human being has the right to forgive bad hearts and broken ways on this earth. He turned to the crippled man and said, get up, roll up your sleeping bundle and walk home. So the man stood up and began to walk home. Then great respect and awe filled the hearts of all who were there. They gave honor to the great spirit for giving such authority to human beings. A tribal tax collector follows him. Creator sets free Jesus left there and as he walked on, he saw a tribal tax collector named Gift from Creator, Matthew, Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Tribal tax collectors were often tribal members who were given the right to collect taxes for the people of iron, Romans. They could force their own people under the threat of violence to pay them. To make a living, they would take more than the people of iron, Romans, required. But many of them became greedy and took even more than they were permitted. They were hated and looked down on by the people. Creator sets free, Jesus, to the surprise of all, walked up to the tribal tax collector and said to him, gift from creator, Matthew, Levi, come and walk the road with me. So he got up from his tax booth, left it all behind, and began to walk the road with Creator sets free, Jesus. In the house of gift from Creator, Matthew, Levi, Creator sets free, Jesus and his followers were sitting down at the table eating with the guests. Among the guests were many tax collector and outcasts. The separated ones, Pharisees, called certain people outcasts. They used their strict interpretation of tribal law as a way to point them out. These outcasts were not permitted to enter gathering houses. They were looked down on and despised by the separated ones, Pharisees. Outcasts included tribal tax collectors, prostitutes, people who ate and drank too much, the ones with diseases that made them ceremoni ceremonially unclean, and anyone who was not a member of the tribes of wrestles with creator Israel. When the separated ones, Pharisees, saw creator sets free Jesus eating with outcasts, 
they complained to his followers saying, why does your wisdom keeper eat with tribal tax collectors and outcasts? Trader sets free, Jesus overheard them and said, people who are well do not need medicine. It is for the ones who are sick. Go and learn this wise saying, what I want is kindness and mercy, not animal sacrifices. I have not come for the ones with good hearts. I have come to help the outcasts find the path back home again. New wine skins for new wine. Some of the followers of He Shows Goodwill, John, came to Creator Sets Free, Jesus, and asked him, why do, you why do you, your followers feast instead of going without food and praying often like we do and the separated ones, Pharisees do? Do you expect wedding guests to be sad and go without eating when the groom is hosting a feast? He asked. The time will come when he is gone. Then they will be sad and go without eating. No one uses a new piece of cloth to patch an old garment. It would shrink and make the tear worse. No one puts new wine into an old wine skin, for the new one would burst the old skins. Then the wine would be lost and the skins ruined. New wine skins are what is needed. Then both wine and skins are preserved. He said this to show that the old ways of the spiritual leaders did not reflect the beauty of the new way he was bringing. The word of the Lord. Now it says. We can't hear you, Casey. Am I on now? There yeah, you there you go. Okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, he's a year older than me. <laughs> so he's my elder. So, so straight for many years. Uh, up here in Denver, Colorado is where I family and I, we went up there to and Richard has been in this area and his wife Susie. Uh, they're uh, currently, and he'll probably tell you, they're, they're living in At some point, he and I, we got to get together and run a, a 5K race together because he's a jogger as well, and we want to do that together. But we look forward to when COVID uh, breaks loose here so that we can have a meeting together. And um, I asked his wife, Susie, if, uh, when that do time does come, that she would make us some Indian coffee. Turn over to Richard now, and uh, God bless you. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good, good. Uh, oh, so you can hear me, good. Uh, let, me, let me start with this joke first that I heard on the radio that made me laugh. Kind of break up things. Uh, humor is very important to our people. So this uh, pastor, uh, this father, 
uh, was asked by uh, a gangster that uh, he would give him a million dollars. Uh, his brother died if if uh, he did the funeral, but also this this gangster, his brother was a gangster too, the one that passed away. He says, I'll give you a million dollars for your building project if you tell him, if you say he was a saint, which of course he wasn't. He was a big time mean gangster and he did a lot of bad things. So the father said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And then, because he needed the money for a building project. And so he thought about it, prayed about it. And he, so the funeral came. He said, how am I going to give, how am I going to save his brother who, uh, who was bad, a saint? So during the service, he did the service. And he says, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, there's brothers there, they did some bad things in their life. And we're sorry that uh, it, we lost, one of them lost his, his life. And, and, uh, and again, you know, they, they, they stumbled and all that, but compared to his brother, he was a saint. So yeah, that's my joke. So uh, I, it's an honor that you invited me this time. Um, we had it earlier, but I had to do something else. So I thought I would do this because uh, some of you might be asked to speak. And in our Native American community, that could happen at a, a community place or a funeral. It could happen at a, a family meeting. It could happen at a burial. And so how would you uh, kind of contextualize the message? You know, our people come from a lot of background, not just one tribe. So as uh, I've been uh, pastoring a church in Denver for quite a while, I, I and I did it for quite a while, and you do 40 sermons a year, and you kind of run out of ideals, and especially to the, the, the people who continually come. You cannot tell uh, a joke that's about four years old because they remember. So your stuff has to be fresh. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I thought I would uh, have some tips on what I did. That just doesn't mean uh, th this narrative uh, sermon is, is uh, things to end all things. But uh, at, when I was uh, 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 a pastor, one of the titles they gave me was license to exhort. Now, what does that mean, exhort? Exhort means to uh, encourage, to lift up. And that's what I want, we should give to our people. I have two examples I want to give uh, of an article uh, that I uh, also wrote and a, a sermon I actually came up with. And uh, by the way, today uh, I, I do blogs, uh, write blogs, on a, a Do Justice blog, and today it was released, it's called uh, Diaspora. So if you, if you type in Do Justice uh, on the internet and uh, CRC Do Justice, my blog will come up on Diaspora. And there's an article I wrote three months ago, it's called uh, Emergence. But if you get stuck, you know, one thing that helped me do, uh, there's a book called The Four Pages of a Sermon. So and it's pretty simple. And really what that says is, uh, from the book is, uh, you talk about problems in the Bible, and then you talk about problems in the world. And then you talk about grace in the Bible, and then you talk about grace in the world. Now, one of the topics that I uh, was using and found to be very helpful uh, was uh, Native American myths. And, and uh, you know, God is, since from Romans 1, it says that uh, God has made his evidence known. Well, how was that done? How was that done to uh, before uh, Christianity came to our people. 
how was that evidence manifest? And one of them might be in our in the myths. And so I want to bring out some of them that uh, the elders would tell the tribe, especially the youth, um, to uplift them. Now you got to remember a long time ago, uh, the myth stories were life and death. Uh, when they and mostly they told the myths in, in, in winter time, but they had, there was a moral message into it. And the white Christianity kind of just threw that out. And one of, in a story that I find out in myths, and a lot of a Native American myth, not just my tribe, Navajo, is uh, coyote. In some cultures, it could be the crow, uh, the crow, a raven. And the coyote in, in uh, my tribe is a uh, trickster. And he kind of messes things up. He, and that's true in our own lives. But, but then you also have a hero too, uh, who kind of practices uh, grace and unselfishness. And uh, now I want to say something. Um, in my, we had one. We had a a, a former uh, Miss Navo come to our church in Denver, and uh, and I didn't know this. Her name was Sunny Do Dewey. And she said, when I start telling a story, you don't want to be too close to me. And we kind of laughed and said, why? Why, why, why are you, uh, you know, chasing us away from the front row? Well, she told us the story. And she kind of, she told the story, the myth, with so much passion that she kind of spit, you know, so much acting. And I always wondered, I think Jesus was like that too. You don't want to stand too close to Jesus because he put so much emphasis in his, in his speech, in, in his, his message that he would, and I think actors do that on stage too, to enunciate to a large crowd. And I'm thinking Jesus probably done that too. So we got to remember that, that, you know, we have to show passion and, and emphasis and, and excitement excitement that we kind of kind of spit and, and that's people would, would understand that to be so in the, in the novel uh the old ways uh they used to do that put a lot of acting into it, a lot of passion into it too and uh but mostly you let the holy spirit talk to you about your your message uh, I'm going to give a, a version. There's an article I wrote called Emergent, in which I used the Neville creation story <coughs> to, uh, and, uh, and I kind of <coughs> used some emphasis in, um, and, uh, with talking to Christians and making it sound, uh, not sound, making it uh, uh, correct when mixing myths and uh, uh, Western Christianity. So this is the uh, first part. This is the uh, uh, novel creation story. Um, this is the story. At the beginning, first man and first woman climbed a water reed from the world of disharmony to the next world, seeking Pujon, which means uh, Neville work harmony. This extension of a read of emergence continued four more times because each world had this recurring pattern of oppositions, imitation, a transformation, and ascension until they emerge to this present world. This reoccurring pattern is only found in the Bible, is also found in the Bible. Opposition, invitation or transformation and ascension. Just as today there were problems in the Bible with, uh, there are problems in the Bible with disharmony, God gives all humanity an invitation to transform. 
Now that Horatius story, uh, you see the, the word immersion or ascension uh, and kind of a, uh, and you, you see the insects are, a lot of the stories are insects uh, doing these things to, to the previous worlds. So taking that myth, that ascension, we can do that with myths too in, in our own lives uh, and talk about uh, exhorting, encouraging. And some of the words, English words I want to use is uh, the word we can use from a story from a myth, a story, a, a narrative, or a, a, a story, a myth, is the word resurrection. When you read a myth, look for that ascension in there, or a renewal, or a regermination, a healing, a forgiveness, a darkness, uh, something from darkness to light, uh, immersion, uh, reform, uh, and, and probably in most Southwest tribes, this word is, is used a lot. It's not used, but it's, the sense of the word is uh, fertility. Like you see corn on uh, the drawings uh, because you see that growth uh, happening. And that's what a message should be in there, a growth, uh, a healing in there our resurrection and ascension. So that's what you could put um, in, your, in your, your narrative. And uh, one thing I wanted to say about that immersion story with the Navajos, I wanted to combine the Navajo uh, with, with Western Christianity and theology. And this took me about 20 years to write that, 20 years to, to kind of combine it. I just thought, oh, thought about it for all this time. And the word, and, 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 and a kind of a warning or not, things you have to watch out for in Native American myths, uh, the things that uh, that's not in our culture is the transformation part. And that only happens from God. We, we tell our story, we tell our, we share a story. But that transformation, that mystery, that renewal happens from God. The, the Holy Spirit catches that person and, uh, and does that. We don't do that. God, God does that. But in our message, uh, there's a quote by Alistair Begg I like to, uh, when you think about uh, the message or narrative, and this is the quote. Keep the main things, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main thing. So don't forget about uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And sometimes it can be hard work. And this next, I say sometimes. And uh, this next uh, illustration, is uh, something I wrote and I kind of uh, use at other churches when I'm invited. Uh, and this is a passage from 828, <coughs> sorry, Romans 828, 31. Now, this, past, this message came to me. Uh, as you can see, I'm old, I'm 65 years old. So when I get up and pray, I, uh, I put a, a Pendleton blanket on me to keep warm early when I first wake up. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but when you first wake up, you, you should pray because the first thoughts uh, that come into your mind as you wake up is not your ego. Your ego is gone. Your pride is gone. And, and we see Jesus going into the mountains of praying in the morning 
So it's good that we, we, we don't have this ego of ourselves. And that happens to me. And that's how I got this, this illustration I want to say to you. So as I am, um, I got this penultimate blanket on me, keeping warm, this message came to me. And it came to me maybe in two sec two minutes to put this together. Um, and I, I can only prompt that to the Holy Spirit working in, in my life. And, and it's called the tapestry of a penultimate blanket. And I'm going to give you the, the points to the highlights. Uh, in our culture, the penultimate blanket is used for gifting, to honor somebody, to honor a, an elder or someone, a visitor. Uh, so that's the importance of a, a penultimate blanket. But we also have to remember uh, God is honoring us too. And, and he, by giving us a blanket, by giving him, giving uh, us his life. But also the, the, the penultimate blanket is a covering and a shield. And we see that in Psalms 91. And the honoring is First Samuel. But also in this penultimate blanket, it's from the sheep, is lanolin. Lanolin is the oil from wool. And, uh, and, and in this sense, in the Bible, it, it's a healing. And we continue to, what else is, is wool in a penultimate blanket? Well, penultimate blanket, I don't know if you know this, but it's fire resistant. Uh, it doesn't catch fire um, like other things. And of course, it, it, we don't want to be on fire at the end of the world. See, that's just a point there. And of course, who can forget wool is the Lamb of God? No. And the Psalms penitent blankets have two sides to it. One side we see, we might see suffering or pain or um, in that, but there's another side to it too. And that's God's uh, view. He's threading, he's weaving the other side that we don't see, that he's the weaver in our lives. But also in the penultimate blanket, we have a warm feeling once we give our lives to Jesus. And again, in the weaving, uh, we see the struggles in life, uh, God weaving our lives we come to find out that it's it's not about us, and that and that message, uh, and it's helpful to have this. And you could you're welcome to use it. You can put the the blanket uh, on the on the podium. So that's contextualizing uh, the message, and, and that came to me in two minutes. I I, I wish I was sick. I was, I was smart enough to put that together by myself. But by reading the Bible, it's like playing the guitar. You start with the basic, <coughs> and then after a while, your, your mind takes over and you come up with your own tune, your own, your own voice in this contextual message. And then that's maybe the last, and I'll end with this, is uh, I was at a conference up in Estes Park, Colorado, and this author, I forgot the name of his author, but he said, uh, uh, and this is another way to talk to the youth, to the youth uh, about prophecy in your narrative. Again, you know our people, they just ask you, could you say a few words knowing that you are a Christian? But this is one thing that I that helps me is uh, anyway, this this author said uh, to a bunch of pastors, including me, he says, uh, as pastor, you should go out and look at art, the youth art, the art of the youth, <coughs> read their poetry, read their 
their their art and all the pastors there are saying why why do we have to do that it doesn't make sense and he says the, the poetry the art they're doing is prophecy their prophet and that's what you take away from it and that's what you speak about is what you see so as leaders uh you have to go out into the world and, and experience new things you may not want to but you know like i had to go to the casino to kind of see what was going on i had to do things uh, that i want to see what what they're doing in the world and you bring that to the podium wherever you are funerals burials family gatherings but mostly you let the Holy Spirit talk to you about uh, what to say. And I, it will come to you. It will come to you in contextualizing. And one last thing I want to say, um, this doing, a, a, taking Native American uh, art and poetry and myths and culture and mixing it with, with Western Christianity is so fun. It is so fun for me because uh, you create your own page. You, you, it, it's, you mix things. Uh, and like, like, for example, uh, Jesus was a, and I tell people that, you know, Jesus was a, des was a brown, desert tribal man. See how we contextualize that to 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 our people. And uh, so uh, and another one I used was uh, it's funny that you know we can see Mother Earth in the Bible and you see that uh, Jesus was born in a stable. Some people say he was in a cave. Well he was born in the womb of Mother Earth. And where was his, uh, and then he was buried in Mother Earth again in a tomb. So at, he, it, was, it was Mother Earth was always there. But we just have to um, search for it sometimes and see that uh, the Bible has a lot of indigenous worldview. Kind of uh, take out uh, the Western Christianity baggage. And it's so fun. It is so fun to do that, you know. Uh, it, it, so, and uh, I thought that is, that's what keeps me going on this contextual um, uh, message. And I'll tell you, a lot of uh, uh, America wants to hear that. They want to see through our eyes. They want to see through uh, our eyes. It was uh, of us looking through a broken window. And they want to hear that. They're so hungry for that. And when we see that, that they're kind of, the youth are kind of tired of uh, 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 established Christianity, mainline. But when we speak with the Holy Spirit's help, they'll listen. And uh, so, uh, if, if you got any questions, uh, and this is not the only way to do a contextualize, but so I, I have a, a challenge to you. Look, look at some of your own or uh, 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 mythology uh, that God has given us, and and use it. Find some uplifting words, resurrection words. Use the coyote as uh, as a guy who mix, who changes things, he's a change maker, which we also have in our own lives. Uh, and the hero, which is, of course is Jesus. Uh, so uh, find, a, find a, a method, play with it, and see uh, what you can do with it. And uh, you, you, it, it, that, that activity will really help you enjoy uh, writing. Uh, a message with the Holy Spirit. So that's the, the end of my uh, 
my talk. So I'm open to questions. Uh, Thank you, Richard. Anybody got a comment or question? Answered everybody's questions, Richard. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yes, um, yes. About cross contextualization. If you're speaking to um, native and non native audience, do you see a great benefit for the um, non native audience listening to cross contextualization? Yes, because they hear the, the, the non natives hear pretty much the same message uh you know i forgot to say include grace into it too uh, but they want to hear how we look at things uh christian wise uh if it's done well yes uh and a lot of leadership want to hear diversity message you know, so yes, if it's if, if the Lord puts upon your heart, uh, uh, what what I find also is uh, Western Christianity has lost the mystery that they used to have, and Native Americans can bring out the mystery again. They the, like the Bible supernatural book, but it. During, uh, during the Enlightenment period, they kind of, uh, the supernatural kind of uh, gone away with. So they love to hear that mystery part that they used to have, uh, that all the answers are line by line in a line linear view rather than a spatial view. And they, that's what they like to hear. Uh, one true story, me and my wife did it. We were invited to speak for five minutes at a Methodist church. And we did, uh, you know what the string game is? They got the star pattern, the string game. Okay, okay. It, it's a string game they do in the wintertime. And there's a string you can make into a star. Like, look that up on the internet. Okay. There's, there, it's, and, uh, you use your fingers, you got a round loop, and you do, a, we did a star, and we, we said that's the star of, of the, the wise men. And that's a kid's game. But when we did that in the Methodist Church, a white Methodist church, after the service, they were so intrigued. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It's a kid's game to us. But when they saw that, they said, it was amazing to them. To us, it's just, it's just kids' game. It's a child's game, but to them, it 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 just just was so amazing because they never seen that. <laughs> so, I know Richard. I you know I've been in this love that I congregations is that is they don't realize that everything that they're doing in their Christian world worship their music it, it has all developed over centuries and there was no so I try to take them back to uh, how things started to where they came from and a lot of that, it, it rubs them the wrong way um, to know that uh, they had to go through uh, you know, many centuries of uh, contextualizing 
They didn't even know they were doing it at the time, but a lot of times they were syncretized too. They were taking things from their pagan culture and then transferring them over in the bench. They became Christian terms, the Christian models. And so I, I try to explain that to them. And I, you know, I know what you know what you're doing and know what you're talking about. And, and I more power to you, my friend. Let's just keep it up. And uh, when we get together, let's uh, let's contextualize together. Yeah, one one thing I want to say in Galatians that says uh, all nations will pretty much evangelize at their appointed time. What does that mean? Uh, well, this is our time. Uh, it's two thousand years after the birth of Christ. Uh, the, the the denomination I'm in was started by the Netherlands Church, the Dutch Reform. We need, as natives, to go back to the Netherlands and preach to them again, because they lost that. So each nation has an appointed time to, to, to evangelize, to come to Christ. But this is our time. Uh, and re, it, that's in found in Galatians. And mm -hmm. I think it's to, re, to, to uh, remind those who are who are believing a faith and they kind of forgotten and they they forgot the mystery and if we can give them the mystery uh, and they'll hear us. <laughs> Any other questions? Right then, if there's no other questions, let's turn it over to the Grovers again. Closing song. All right, so we got a <clears throat> closing song here for you. And uh, this is actually a song that I've never performed, even though it's a song um, that has been part of my relationship with Creator Sense Free uh, from the very beginning. Um, it's a version of a psalm, and uh, Matthew Ward originally did this in 1977. Um, but <clears throat> with our talk tonight, I was thinking a lot about it because this, you know, he uses kind of an, an older version of the scriptures, but it talks about, you know, the rock that is higher than I. And in those times when you were um, being oppressed by another people, if you could, you know, you buildings weren't the, like how they are now but if you could find caves on cliffs that were high up that could be a place of refuge and a place of strength for you and uh and so in this psalm the person's crying out in their desperation and saying god creator bring me restore me to that place of safety and harmony with you and uh and i was reminded of it when when heather was sharing from creator's words uh, where Creator Sets Free said, you know, I have come to bring those who are lost and bring them back to the good path. And when Richard was sharing about the Navajo creation stories about how how first man and first woman had to climb up the reed. They had to climb up to a higher uh, refuge. And, and Creator didn't just like magically lift them up. Like they had to go on the path that creator set uh, for them. And so that's what this song kind of reminds me about. And uh, let me share the screen and get everything set up.
from the ends of the earth I call to thee when my heart is faint Lead me to the rock that is higher than I For thou hast been a refuge for me And the tower of strength against the enemy A tower of strength against the enemy Hear my cry, O oh God, give heed to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I call to thee when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a refuge for against the enemy, a tower of strength against the enemy, a tower of strength against the enemy, and let me dwell in thy tent. Forever Preston, would you like to send us off? Sorry, I was just basking in the moments of your music. Uh, um, from scripture all the way down to our questions and being answered. Lord, you are here with us. You are teaching us so many great things. Being able to have us have our love strengthened. Be able to understand that our culture and our and our language and our things that we have learned are so powerful and so big. They are so connected to you in so many ways. We just don't know all of them yet. Which is the mysterious that we have to trust and have faith that in those moments and those unanswered questions, and when the time comes, when we do depart from this world, we will learn those answers. But at the same time, when we find the answers here on this earth before we depart, it's our job, our responsibility, and love to love others by teaching them those things that we have learned and expand expanding our knowledge to everyone that needs it that will help themselves to learn to love themselves to love their culture love who they are and knowing it aligns with god because our love and everything that we need should come from god we don't need anything more we don't need any items, no materials that come from this earth. 
all we just need is to worship and remember salvation and glory come from the from the one who sits on the throne and the lamb and with that we'll all be dressed in white robes when we do our part and our responsibility when we put hand our teachings in our contextualized ways to to the younger ones. And you could name me pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us and having us understand you as a better person. How to be part of your lives and be become one another and to become love. The same love that God has given us. Yeah. Until next time, there's always women's group on Wednesdays right. and in next week. So yeah. next time, guys. Love you all. Love you all. all. Right. See Good everybody. Night. Thank you so much, Richard, for sharing. See you all next week. Thank you.